this point, I'd like to talk a little bit about why we are interested in myocarditis. In this hospital, we have an interest in patients with heart muscle disease, heart failure, rhythm disturbances. And, as a, and through that, we have been following up many of our patients with a whole range of conditions. But really, one of the things that a patient like that really drew our interest in myocarditis was the fact that we had a lot of young patients who were completely well and then were being afflicted by a viral infection, completely well, high level sports men and women, and then suddenly they get a bad viral infection that everyone gets, and then they get this label of myocarditis. And then suddenly everyone starts looking up myocarditis, what does it mean, what is it, how does it affect the heart, and there's virtually nothing or very limited information or spectrums of information when you look up uh, a Google search. The other thing that, that really galvanized our efforts in this area was the experience of one of our, uh, the father of one of our uh, of the patients, Andy Janssens, who I'd like to introduce in a moment, who tragically lost his son and, and really felt at that time that nothing was being done in this field and came up to us and said, how can we as a community, doctors, patients, nurses, medical colleagues, how can we make a difference? And it's really with that that I'd like to introduce Andy, Andy Janssens, who set up the Alexander Janssens Foundation in memory of his son to talk about his experience um, and to, to welcome you all to this evening. Thank you. Um, I'm Andy Jensen's. Um, Sanjay really sort of hit the nail on the head. Um, uh, when I, when we lost Alexander, um, almost four years ago now, the diagnosis was myocarditis. And that just came out of nowhere. And it was the symptoms that Sanjay just described, really. So Alexander had been, he was 18, prime of life, very healthy. I'd just been on a trip with his friends to Croatia to a dance music festival on the beach on a fantastic time and he called home whilst he was away to say I wasn't feeling too good, thinking I had a bad piece of chicken um, from a takeaway, a bit of food poisoning um, but carried on, um, enjoyed the party and came home and had flu-like symptoms for about two weeks I think actually and had gone to his doctor, I went to the doctor twice if not probably twice, I don't think three times during that two week period of flu-like symptoms. And then recovered, um, came to Saturday, he was back out partying again, and um, on Saturday actually I was away in Spain, we were about to go away on holiday in Spain, and my wife, my then wife called me and said, said I was in Spain, I was on time. And I panicked, I was on wood, broke down, got myself back to the UK, and at that time, I think Royal Brompton were in touch with High Wycombe Hospital, so we lived in Beckinsfield. They didn't really have an idea of what was going on here. But a lot of you may have experienced this when you've been out there, that people, you know, a lot of hospitals don't really understand. But they were um, clever enough to seek specialist advice, which was St. Jane Royal Brompton Hospital. And the symptoms I just described. The prognosis was that, you know, we f that they felt that 95% is myocarditis. Now, at that point in time, like a lot of you, you have never heard of myocarditis. And as Sanjay just described, when I was trying to find out what the hell this thing is in the first place, the first thing you do is go on the internet and you have a look around. And you look at the obvious websites, British Heart Foundation, probably the main one. Um, there's also a, a very good American website, which some of you may come across as well. But I'm thinking, this is not very good. You know, you've got a couple of paragraphs everywhere. Um, nowhere to go for help. Um, no other societies or web pages or anything to go to. Um, and I thought, well, it's not really good enough, actually. I need to find out more. I need to know, you know, what, could we have prevented it? Should, be, should we be watching out for something? Um, so I went to see the British Heart Foundation, had similar discussions there. If you looked on their webpage, and I haven't looked on there for a long time, to be honest with you, but at the time they had again about three or four paragraphs. And uh, I was very lucky to actually um, see one of the head guys, I can't remember his name, so I do know, one of the head guys. Yes, he spent an hour with me talking about myocarditis. And in summary, having spent an hour with me talking about myocarditis, um, I think he called it a dustbin, um, not in a, I, I thought it was a derogatory way at the time, but what it meant was they tend to put cases into this dustbin that they don't really understand, and they're like a myocarditis heading. And I really had a feeling at that point in time that 
it wasn't really good enough. You know, somebody's got to do something about it. People weren't doing anything about it. And I was all sorts of ideas, and I asked British Heart Foundation to back me, and they wouldn't because they didn't understand if the money we were raising would be targeted properly. And that's where, where I've ended up, and we've ended up working with Royal Brompton and Sanjay. To, you know, one of the things we do is produce evenings like this, where hopefully you don't get in the same position that I was, where you can't get questions answered, or people can't answer those questions, or people can't help you. So tonight's really about that, and you know, we've all worked together with some of the headings that we know are probably close to you, but as Sanjay said, please ask questions on the way, because you know, we won't cover anything. Uh, equally, of Sanjay and everybody else is going to speak out of themselves as well. Um, I'll stop there, and I think Amrit, uh, you're going to carry on with, with tonight's programme. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you very much. So um, I'm going to provide a brief overview of myocarditis. We've already met a number of you through our research studies, but just to make sure everyone's up to speed, we're just going to cover some of the basics. So myocarditis literally means inflammation of the heart muscle. The term itself comes from a combination of ancient Greek and Latin words. And it was first actually used in 1812 by a French physician working for Napoleon. So myocarditis can affect anyone and can occur at any age. Uh, there are numerous different causes, but the main cause is normally a viral infection, which then triggers myocarditis in patients. There are a number of other causes listed there as well. For example, certain drugs and toxins and other things like radiation therapy and side effects of other medication too. In terms of the signs and symptoms, some of you may be familiar with this, so um, patients can often report chest pain that can mimic a heart attack. They can have a fever, an irregular heart rhythm, shortness of breath, tiredness, general symptoms from a recent viral illness. In terms of how common myocarditis is, this is a number that's been quite difficult to pin down, but in 2013, the Global Burden of Disease study showed that 22 cases were found in every 100,000 of the population worldwide. So that essentially equates to about 1.5 million cases in the world in 2013. In terms of presentations then, so most patients will usually come in with a history of chest pain and will be labelled as having a heart attack and often will be treated as though they are a patient having a heart attack and then eventually it will be determined that it's actually myocarditis. Unfortunately, some patients can experience heart rhythm disturbances and those can be quite fatal in some cases, resulting in a sudden cardiac arrest. And also, whilst myocarditis is self-limiting in most patients, unfortunately a third can go on to develop a weak and baggy heart. And that's a condition that we call a dilated cardiomyopathy. That itself has lots of problems and is the leading cause for needing a heart transplant in the UK. So what is actually happening in myocarditis? So just as a quick overview, because the next people will go into more depth about this, there is usually direct damage to the heart muscle cells, and that can be due to a virus or due to a drug or a toxin or something else. And that results in the release of muscle cell content into the bloodstream, which is what we normally look for on our blood test. And that leads to activation of inflammatory and immune responses to try and tackle that initial insult. So what we're essentially looking at is acute inflammation within the heart and inflammation in the body is the same everywhere. So you have heat, pain, redness and swelling and these are things that have been reported for hundreds of years, at first by the Romans. And the way to think about myocarditis is almost like an ankle sprain. So it's hot, it's painful, it's red, it's swollen. And those are the kind of changes that normally happen in the heart when myocarditis is first there. So in terms of how we pick that up, so we have a number of tests that we can use. So we have our ECG heart tracings, we have our blood tests to look for troponin, uh, we have ultrasound scans of the heart, MRI scans, and in some cases might go on to perform a biopsy. So this is uh, an image of um, an echo on a patient with myocarditis, and from this basic echo we can assess the size of the heart and the function of the heart. But cardiac MRI is generally a lot more helpful because as well as getting that basic information, we can then look to see if there are regions that have increased swelling or scar formation, as you can see indicated on that slide there. So coming to the end, so in terms of how we treat myocarditis, well at the moment for most patients, the guidance is to rest and to avoid exercise for a period of three to six months. And again, the analogy here is to sort of rest, ice, compress, elevate after an ankle sprain. Obviously you can't do 
three of those things so we can just rest the heart. And painkillers can be taken as required as well. Unfortunately, there are no specific treatments that we can use to tackle a viral infection, but there are some other treatments that we can use in some cases, which um, we'll go into later. So that's just a, a brief overview of my practice. So, um, I, I'm a pathologist. Now, um, obviously, the pathologist looks at, looks at pieces of tissue. Now, as uh, always already mentioned, occasionally with myocarditis, the diagnosis is made on a piece of tissue, a biopsy. Now, quite often, the image of pathologist is somebody who lives in a basement, who has a sort of a, a guy hanging around him called Eagle with a hunchback, and you know, I sort of drag dead bodies around. That's not entirely true. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just sort of run you through what I do, but specifically with regards to myocarditis, because when you do come across, when you're talking to a physician and he starts talking about biopsies, I hope my talk will give you a better view and a better insight into what we actually do with those biopsies and what the information is that we get from that sort of biopsy. And also the problems we encounter as a pathologist, but also as the clinicians interpreting the results, my results, and how that can affect you as well. So, what is a pathologist? Obviously, I don't have a, a guy with a hunchback hanging around, but basically what I do is I have a microscope and I magnify a piece of tissue and I can look at all the cells in that piece of tissue and then sort of discover if there is inflammation in myocarditis or anything else. But that's basically what I do. So effectively, I make a diagnosis. The clinician will give me a differential diagnosis based on an MRI or another imaging modality or their clinical impression and if they're not entirely sure what it is they can take a biopsy a piece of tissue in this case from the heart if they think it's myocarditis but they're not 100% sure I can then look at the biopsy and say yes or no at least that's what I hope because it's not that simple fortunately um, I happen to be Dutch well the first microscope you know Anton van Leeuwenhoek what can I say um, <laughs> But to be perfectly honest, we haven't progressed that much. This is the actual first microscope somewhere in the 1600s. Um, we then progressed to these uh, incredibly complex machines here, and that's a microscope hooked up to a PC. Now, we do have things like digital pathology, which I'll just sort of mention uh, and show you an example of, but effectively, what we're still doing is the same as this, unfortunately. But we're trying to move forward. But it's a microscope, we look through the microscope and we magnify pieces of tissue and we can see inflammation and then say, yes, this could be a myocarditis. So this is what our laboratory looks like. Just to run you through what happens, the biopsy is taken from the heart. These are the small pieces of tissue that you can see here. They're then embedded in paraffin. And from that paraffin block, we cut very, very thin slices. These slices are so thin, they're about hundreds of a millimetre thick. We place them on the glass slide, we stain them because otherwise it's transparent and we can't see anything. And then with that stained piece of tissue, we can look under the microscope and see what's what. So effectively, that's the sort of route that it goes through when a biopsy is taken. So, in general, what can we see? Above we have the slides. Depending on how we magnify it, whether it's 20 times or we magnify it 400 times, we'll see different things. But as we can see here, this is normal heart tissue. The black blobs that you see are the actual nucleus of the heart cells. So that's where all the DNA <coughs> is. Surrounding it is the actual cell with all the organelles and whatnot in it. Now, depending on how we uh, look at it, magnification, this is basically what I see day to day. So we've just had a look at normal myocarditis, so uh, normal myocardium, normal heart muscle. So what's different in myocarditis? Well, I think it's already been mentioned, there's inflammation. So there's obviously all these white blood cells uh, diving into the myocardium because it's obviously an infection, viral, but it could also be another cause. Uh, we'll come to that in a minute. 
But in general, what I'm looking for is cells or are cells that shouldn't be there. We saw the normal myocytes, the heart muscle cells with their big nucleus and the cytoplasm that's the surrounding cell and we didn't really see any inflammation. When I start to see inflammation, and I'll show you some examples, these sort of cells, then I can say this could be a myocarditis because there are inflammatory cells in a place where I wouldn't expect them. And depending on what those cells are, I can sometimes <coughs> differentiate between the cause, could it be a viral infection or could it be an allergy, for example. Um, but I can also say whether it's you know, ongoing or is it chronic, etc. But ultimately, the inflammation leads to the destruction of the heart muscle. Now this is important because this is what I need to see to say it is an actual myocarditis. That's one of the criteria that we have sort of agreed on as pathologists, we need to see actual destruction. Again, that's not entirely black and white because if I see a lot of infiltrate, a lot of lymphocytes, and I just do not happen to have that place biopsy where there is damage, I would still call it for myocarditis. But preferably, inflammation with damage is what I would call a myocarditis. So, this is normal heart, muscle, these big blobs again are the nuclei, so if you sort of keep that in mind, this is myocarditis. You can still see the nuclei of the heart muscles, but all those little black dots, they're lymphocytes, and they shouldn't be there, as we just saw in the previous picture. So this is a typical myocarditis, and I would call this a lymphocytic myocarditis. There are various different terms, but when you see lots of lymphocytes, quite often it's viral, and then we term it viral or lymphocytic myocarditis. Now, I talked about muscle damage. Now, all these are heart muscle cells. But you can see where the black arrow is, those black dots, that's a nucleus. So, if I just point out here, heart muscle cell, that's the nucleus. Another nucleus, hey, it disappears. It's literally been destroyed by the lymphocytes. So, just behind that arrow, you see that there's no continuation of that cell. That's what I call damage. So that's literally what happens in a myocarditis. But there are other forms of myocarditis. You can have giant cell myocarditis. Uh, can we dim the light a little bit? Is that possible? Now, now I can actually see what I'm showing you, that helps, doesn't it? So, as you can see, there are some large, sort of odd-looking cells right at the top. Now, they're called giant cells, the reason being they're quite big. That's why we call them giant cells. Now, this is a different type of myocarditis. It has a different origin, but we call this giant cell myocarditis. I won't get too much into the details of you know, why it's and what the origins of that are. This again is a lymphocytic myocarditis. You can see where basically the muscle cells at the edge have sort of disappeared and they've been damaged and destroyed. Here, and it's slightly difficult with the projector, you can see that there are all sorts of little red cells in between. And these are what we call eosinophils. That's a special type of lymphocyte and you usually see this in cases where there's been a medication allergy or another allergic reaction, which can also cause myocarditis. So again, if I see all these eosinophils, these red cells here, I will say it could be a lymphocytic myocarditis, so it could be viral, but please check to see if the patient has no medication that he's allergic to or there's no allergic reaction ongoing, because this, for me, would point towards that. Now, what you see here is scarring. Now, mainly this is sort of early scarring that's going on. So the myocytes have disappeared, 
but uh, sorry, the, my, the lymphocytes have disappeared. But because there's been damage, like anything else in your body, if you cut yourself or you graze, you'll have a scar. The heart's no different. The, mu the myocytes, the heart muscle cells, can't actually regenerate. So what happens is they're replaced by scar tissue. Here we see, in between the cells, beginning scar tissue. And eventually, just like in the hand where you see a scar there, you see more solid scar tissue forming. And that's what you can also see on the MRI. So, imagine a patient is diagnosed by Sanjay with myocarditis, but they take a biopsy. I look under my microscope, and this is what I see. Does that mean that the patient doesn't have myocarditis? This is sort of the difficulty that we sometimes get into. So, you would expect if you take a biopsy, you know, I will see the lymphocytes, I will be able to give a conclusion or a diagnosis. But unfortunately, the lymphocytes are not evenly spread out in the heart. They're very patchy. And the biopsy is extremely small. So obviously they can't take a big chunk out of the heart. They can only take a small few pieces of tissue like we saw there, which could just be one millimeter. If you happen to take a biopsy just in between two foci of lymphocytes, you might get what looks like normal tissue. So, even if I can't see the lymphocytes, if it's clinically, by Sanjay saying that no, this really looks like a myocarditis, I won't say it's not a myocarditis, I will simply say I can't see it in the biopsy, but I can't exclude it. The pathologist is an expert in very wishy-washy language. It's what we, we get taught this, straight away from, we come out of med school, go into training, first thing they teach us is how to make a sentence that makes absolutely no conclusion. <laughs> so I will effectively say, I don't see it on here, but again, if you do come across this, if you're talking to a clinician, if you're discussing the biopsy results, it doesn't mean to say it's not there. It just means to say that I lucked out and I got pieces of tissue with no lymphocytes in it. Now, let me see if I can do this. That should actually. No, that's obviously not working. I'll try that in a second to see if I can get that sorted. And I'll show you an actual slide as I would look at it, zooming in and out. Okay? But I'll just finish the talk first. Now, again, that's a problem that we have if we can't see anything. So, not seeing information doesn't rule out myocarditis. But like I said, it's very patchy, and always remember, they're very, very small pieces of tissue. So it can be very difficult. Just to sort of give you an example, this is a football field, and I'm sort of going to cover my eyes and try and just put my finger on the football player. I might miss the first time, I might miss the second time, but if I'm lucky, I'll get somebody from Feyenoord who won the Dutch Cup. <laughs> I happen to come from, my last job was in Rotterdam, so yay five, you know, I, I am an avid supporter. Uh, and after, I think, 15 years, it was about time they won the cup as well. So, but just to give you an example, that's basically what happens. You're looking at a large field with players scattered about. The players, in this case, are inflammation or myocytes. And the cardiologist has to find a very small piece of tissue with a player in it. And sometimes that's not that easy. So just to summarize, the biopsy of the heart muscle is, in principle, the gold standard. So when we do take a biopsy, effectively, you should be able to prove that there is myocarditis with that biopsy, if the biopsy was taken in the right place. The histopathologist, or the pathologist, if you hear that term, that's me. I examine that biopsy, and I will say, yes, this looks like a myocarditis. There are many different types of myocarditis. Each has a different origin, a different cause, and a different histological picture, as we saw, the giant cells, or the eosinophils, or the lymphocytes. 
Now, I'd just like to show you this if we have time. So, this is a slide that we scanned in, so it's been digitalized. Now, this is what I would see underneath my microscope. If we zoom in, or we pull it around a little bit, you can already see that these are the heart muscle cells, this is the nucleus, but in between there appear to be quite a few of these black cells. These are lymphocytes. So I've shown you some very clear-cut examples, but quite often this is what I'll get. But if we're lucky, we zoom in a little bit, these are lymphocytes and you can see that this is a very unhappy heart muscle cell. It's being destroyed. So on the basis of this area, I would be happy to call this myocarditis. So the pictures I showed you before are wonderful, but this is more the reality. Just thinking back, if you look, it already looks a little bit on the dark side. The darkness comes because you can see the red heart muscle cells, but in between, there are lots of lymphocytes that shouldn't be there. And if you've seen a lot of these, even from a distance, so you're not sort of zooming in, you can already say something's going on. This is probably going to be myocarditis. For the simple reason, all those lymphocytes that are sort of in between the heart cells, they're giving it a slightly dark effect. So, effectively, I, you know, I don't even need a very fancy microscope to do this. But it is quite difficult to do because you need a right biopsy. So don't get angry with the pathologist if he comes back with a wishy answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Lucas, thank you very much. Um, one of the questions that people often ask is, well, does everyone need a biopsy? And 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we would routinely do a biopsy in, it, in many of our patients that had suspected myocarditis. Because the, the imaging technology has evolved so much now, we are seeing evidence of myocarditis on MRI scans from the clinical history. And therefore, we now tend to use biopsies in those patients that are not doing well. Their heart muscle isn't working properly. They're developing heart failure symptoms that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, occasionally, if they're needing transplant or they're not responding to treatment. And that tends to be where the biopsy comes in in its main clinical role rather than for everyone. But certainly when we have that challenge, it's great to have our pathologists, people like Jan Lucas and colleagues across the country, look at those and tell us what is happening, and importantly, why is that heart muscle not recovering? Um, in the next talk, which will be by myself, we're going to talk about treatment, lifestyle, and exercise. Jan Lucas, thank you very much. Um, so the overview of my talk is that we're going to look at medical treatment, we're going to talk about lifestyle, we're going to talk about exercise. And certainly when we gave this talk last time, there were a couple of areas that generated a lot of interest, a lot of questions, and one of them was exercise, and I'll do my best to try and provide <coughs> as much information as we have um, and with uh, an update on what the guidance is. Um, much of the information we use is from this document. This was a, a consensus document where doctors from across Europe came together and they tried to establish what is known about myocarditis and what recommendations and guidance can we give to our patients. So this is from the European Society of cardiology for any of you that are interested in, in looking at the source. So when the patient comes, the first thing we want to ask ourselves is, is why do they have myocarditis? We know that they've got some sort of inflammation of the heart, but as Jan Lucas said, there are many, many types, and some of those can guide your treatment. So the first question is why? And it's not that straightforward. This is a very busy slide, but what it does is it highlights all the various causes that can, that can result in myocarditis, resulting in, um, from infections, <coughs> immune-mediated drugs, um, to toxins, excess alcohol, heavy metals. So there's a whole range of things that can cause myocarditis. In practice, though, the bulk tend to be where the red arrows are, which is a viral cause, some sort of allergic reaction, and drugs. And so in the history, it's paramount to understand why does a patient have the myocarditis and make sure that you've covered all of those different aspects in the history. Um, and occasionally, perhaps in more exotic locations, it may be a scorpion sting or a spider bite, wasp sting. 
So again, it's important to take a detailed history about why these patients are presented. But again, emphasizing that the commonest causes are going to be a virus, some sort of drug reaction, uh, or, or uh, uh, an effect of some other aspect. And even within a viral cause, there's about 30 viruses that can cause the condition ranging from the common cold type virus to hepatitis to, to yellow fever uh, to HIV type things. So there's a whole range of things that can cause it, some being way more common than others. The other thing that we want to think about when we're talking about treatment is at what point is that patient presenting to us? So if you've got someone who's been unwell for a week, they've had a bad viral infection, they now get chest pain, they've got uh, abnormal ECGs, their MRI scan shows signs of myocarditis, the need for treatment is going to be very different to someone who's had the condition, say, a year ago. And that reflects the fact that there are differences between the acute phase and the chronic phase. And so the majority of patients, when you see them, tend to be in the acute phase. And for the majority, their condition, thankfully, will resolve spontaneously. But a small subset, about a third, as Dr. Luther said, will go on to a chronic phase where they may develop that dilated cardiomyopathy. And what's happening in the early phase is that your virus is causing mischief, and then you've got an antibody reaction occurring during the subacute phase. And then during the later phase, this is where we're seeing scarring in the heart developing, where we're seeing dilatation, where we're seeing the function of the heart become more impaired. And if there's no, no cut, fixed cutoff time, all of these processes will be happening at different stages with variation across patients. And so there are many challenges in managing these patients. First of all, there's no single hit. When a patient presents with a heart attack that's due to coronary artery disease, a blockage in the blood supply, there's one cause. They haven't got enough blood supply to the heart muscle. They've taken a heart, they've got a heart attack, and you know how to treat that. Try and open up the blood vessel. But this is very different. Here we've got about 30 or 40 different causes that are, that are causing the heart muscle to become impaired, viruses being the commonest, but there are other things as well. And that means treating it has to be very much challenged either to covering all bases or targeting it to what specifically caused that insult. So think about what may have caused it, particularly the virus. Is it a rheumatological condition? Does the patient have rheumatoid arthritis, for example? Again, another common cause where there are certain treatments. And then what are the symptoms? Most patients will present with chest pain, they'll subside after a few days, they're gonna be fine. And the key priority there is A, control their chest pain, and then B, make sure that they're not getting any of the sequelae, and any of the long-term consequences. But occasionally, in a small subset, they will develop that heart failure, they will develop dilated cardiomyopathy, and we'll look at how to manage that. A small percentage will also get heart rhythm disturbances. And again, the majority will be fine, low level, but occasionally and tragically, uh, as Andy Anson knows, with Alexander, he had a fatal heart rhythm disturbance. So what is the risk of that? How can we identify who may be at high and low risk? So the majority of patients, it's very important to emphasize, are gonna be fine, they're gonna do well, this is gonna be a nuisance, they're gonna recover. The symptoms are gonna be mild, chest pain, maybe a bit of shortness of breath, maybe a bit of fatigue, but they're gonna be pretty much back to normal by about six weeks, and their outlook is extremely good. In that patient population, the key, the mainstay of treatment is conservative measures. So pain control, um, some people use non -steroidals. We tend to prefer a drug called colchicine, and there is some evidence that non may or may not have an adverse effect, so we kind of steer away from them. But for some patients, you have to use it, because the other drug, colchicine for pain, doesn't really cut it. So non being drugs like root and Voltron. Actually, uh, my son's had this twice now. Sure. And after the second episode, they prescribed six months of colchicine. Sure. And if you look up colchicine, it says it's basically used for gout. Sure. It doesn't mention no, no, that, so, that, so what actually is it and what does it do? So, so it's a drug that helps to reduce inflammation. And in gout, you're getting a lot of active inflammation. And what we're using it for in myocarditis is to help suppress some of that inflammation and also to control the pain symptoms. Uh, so, so that would be its main application there. And then again, it, uh, the other mainstay of management is how severe is the condition. So treatments can range from um, bed rest that we mentioned, that fits severe oxygen, and then also lifestyle changes that we'll cover as well. Not drinking alcohol, so we recommend not to have more than one drink a day, uh, to abstain certainly for the first month or so, and then after that, maybe introduce it if the heart function is well, patients recovered fully. 
one of the big challenges is when patients have had that chest pain, they've recovered from that, but then a few weeks later, they then start to present with shorts of breath. And one of our concerns here is, has the muscle taken a hit? And as Yanuka showed, the muscle cells themselves are starting to be injured, and so instead of pumping well, the heart muscle has become weak, it's become baggy. And this is where patients may present with heart failure or a dilated cardiomyopathy. The heart is enlarged, dilated cardio heart, myo muscle pathy disease. And so dilated cardiomyopathy occurs in about a third of patients. The heart isn't pumping well enough, therefore there is back fill of, of, of fluid, of the, the blood, and therefore patients will typically present with congested lungs, heart, uh, so symptoms of shortness of breath. They may get fluid buildup in the legs, so they'll get swir swollen ankles, and their exercise capacity will be reduced, they will be fatigued. And so an important range of symptoms that we want to be aware of. And in that situation, in the acute phase, if they present to hospital, you think about giving them oxygen, get more air into the body, water tablets to try and offload some of that extra fluid that's building up, and then drugs to help improve the pumping function of the heart. So drugs such as the NACE inhibitor, uh, Ramipril, Rindipril, drugs that you may have heard of, that boost and improve the pumping efficiency, and a beta blocker, which is a drug that slows the heart rate down, so it gives it more time to rest, that allows more blood flow into the heart muscle, and stabilizes the heart rhythm. So these drugs can be very effective, and for some patients, they may need all of these. For some patients, we may just manage them with one of these, and it's very much individualized, depending on the need of the patient and how they're presented. If there is evidence of active inflammation, for example, on the scan or on their biopsy if they needed it, or if their blood markers of inflammation still up, then we may think, what else can we do? Now, if the symptoms persist, we've done a biopsy because they're symptomatic, they're not doing well, and, we've, and they've got reduced function, then in that situation, we may complement their treatment by also thinking about drugs to suppress that abnormal immune response. What's happening is the virus is attacking the, the heart muscle cell and it's causing direct injury. But as we saw in that subacute phase, the body's immune response is over-responding. It's, it's attacking its own, it's the, the body's own cells. So can we suppress that immune response? And so drugs like steroids, another drug called azathioprine, can sometimes be useful. And again, it's very much individualized. It's not that everyone will get all of these treatments. Again, if the patient has not done well, they're developing worsening heart failure, they're not responding to the medications, again, we may do a biopsy, and then, and then if we picked up a virus, it may be that we target specific treatment to that viral agent. And one of the common agents used will be either a direct agent to hit that virus or interferon therapy um, that we're sometimes using in these patients, and we may or may not complement that with high-dose steroids. Occasionally, patients can present with rhythm disturbance. What's happening here now is that those immune cells are attacking the body's pacemaker, or they're causing fibrosis, and so sometimes that can act as an irritant to the heart muscle, generating these rhythm disturbances. If it's mild, we may just watch, but if it's severe and the heart's going too slowly, we may need to introduce a pacemaker to stimulate the heart rhythm, to <coughs> the heart to beat faster, or if it's going too fast, we may need to protect the body against dangerous rhythm disturbances. And this is where we use something called the defibrillator, again, a more sophisticated type of pacemaker. Thankfully, this is in the minority of patients, but about 10, 12% of patients with the severe myocarditis that aren't showing recovery may go on to need these things. So the pacemaker, uh, it's implanted underneath the skin, and you have wires going into the heart that are, tri that are detecting the heart rhythm and if it's too slow, they're stimulating the heart rhythm. For patients that are having episodes that are too fast, it will either overdrive that fast rhythm or deliver a small electric shock to kickstart the heart back into a regular rhythm. Things to avoid in the acute phase, again, there is controversy about non-steroidals, proof and voltural. Um, some patients, some um, teams use it. <coughs> Currently, the thinking is it's probably best avoided, but that's not a golden rule, and be aware that Part of the reason why there's a, a, that uncertainty is that this is not a condition where on any one day we can ring up a thousand patients and say, right, we know you've all got myocarditis, let's try half of you with, half of you without. This is thankfully a relatively uncommon condition, but devastating in some patients when it occurs, thankfully mild in the majority. We recommend reducing their alcohol consumption, and with exercise, what do we say? So in the acute phase, we would say hold off exercise, 
anything more than mild levels of excise. So, and definitely avoiding competitive high intensity excise. And generally the guidance on that is to avoid high level excise for about three to six months. In our own teams, we would use six months. So up to mild, building up to moderate levels is probably okay. Uh, whereas excessive exercise or high intensity exercise, we would say you need to refrain from and definitely competitive level. So patients often say, well, that's great. But what does that mean in plain English? What is mild? So walking and stuff, going for a gentle cycle, that's fine. But going to the point where you can't talk in full sentences when you exercise, that would be a, a definition of intense exercise or pushing your heart rate to beyond 85% target heart rate, so 220 minus your age multiplied by 85%. That would be intense, and certainly pushing it above target heart rate would be a guide for those of you that use Fitbit to refrain from <coughs> very high intensity exercise. So Can you repeat the numbers, please, 220? Yeah, 220 minus your age multiplied by about 85%. Okay. But a very simple, very simple measure is really, can you talk in full sentences or not? Um, so if you're able to talk in full sentences, you're not exercising to your maximum level. If you can comfortably hold a, a conversation, yeah, you're, you're probably at the right sort of level uh, as, a, as, a, as a sort of benchmark and yardstick. And again, there isn't 5,000 patients in a study to show that this is right, this is wrong. So this is based on the evidence of bringing these doctors from across Europe and saying what is their experience, what works, what doesn't work, what is the evidence showing, what are the problems that, that patients with, when patients have had a problem with myocarditis, what were they doing beforehand? It's collating all of that information. And for some reason, myocarditis only seems to happen in high-level sports men and women. It doesn't occur in, in your nerds that like computer programming. <laughs> and so one of the key questions we always get asked is, so can I run a marathon? And you're like, well, I don't know. Right? And, and the advice we always give is, hold off for six months. But what do we do after that period? Well, after six months, if the patient's completely well, their heart function is normal, they've had no rhythm disturbance, what we would then think about doing is, is corroborating that. So we do an echo scan or an MRI scan. Is the heart function normal? Yes, great. Get a, a heart rhythm monitor. So at least for 24 hours, maybe 48 hours or longer, can we pick up any rhythm disturbances? If we're not, great. And then we have to exercise them, put them on a treadmill. Putting patients on the treadmill is a great way of bringing out any irritability in the heart rhythm. So if they can exercise to a high level that is symptom limited, when they're literally begging us to say, please push the stop button, they've, not got, any, they've got normal function and we're not picking up any irritability, we would say to them, cautiously get back to, to normal activity and probably phase it in um, and, then, and then build up, but, but back to normal activities. If they've got scarring, we may be a little bit more conservative and just say, well, build it up to moderate, let's see how you get on, and then take it going forward. In the, in the, um, in the sports guidelines, if they've got lots of fibrosis, it may be that we would say, let's, let's refrain you from that very high, very high level, competitive level of athletics. What about prevention? Well, there is some evidence that vaccination makes a difference, but it's relatively limited. And as you know, every year, there seems to be a different viral strain. So, so the evidence that this helps is anecdotal. It's fairly limited. And one of the things that we in a number of groups are looking at, therefore, is can we identify patients that somehow or other are vulnerable? Our paradigm at the moment is patient comes in, they have chest pain, they get a diagnosis of myocarditis, what are you going to do about it? But where, really where we want to be, and, and Dr. Lewis will talk about this when looking at research across the world, is how can we identify the at-risk patient before they've even had this in itself? And that's going to be one of the challenges, but also where the opportunities are. Are there patients that are more vulnerable, for example, because they have some gene abnormality? Everyone gets a cold, everyone gets a viral infection. But why is it that some patients come down with myocarditis when the majority of them be fine? So these are the kinds of things that we, we really want to understand. So in my closing slide, um, really the mainstay of treatment, number one, deal with the treatment. Secondly, is there any evidence of heart failure? If there isn't, survey patients, keep them under some form of surveillance. Is there any rhythm disturbance? And then target the therapy, particularly to those that have that rhythm disturbance or where there is poor heart function. Thank you very much. Thank you.